This is the Lions Unchained podcast, where the shackles of your mind are broken. It's not for the faint-hearted, but the chosen few who've embraced the call to leadership, dare to venture where others will not, and believe in God's supernatural power. Join Carl Joseph now for a life-changing word. Get ready to be unleashed into your destiny. Gentlemen, it's time to close your ears because we're going to talk to the ladies today and more specifically about a woman's role in the ministry. Now, all joking aside, in truth, gents, you need to hear this too because we're the ones guilty of discriminating women in ministry. So we need to perk up and listen intently to this message. Now, some conservative denominations think women should just keep quiet in church and forget about the ministry altogether. And they use two of the Apostle Paul's statements to back this up, namely 1 Corinthians 14.34 and 1 Timothy 2.12. So let's read 1 Corinthians 14.34 now. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Then again, Paul goes one step further, stating that women should not teach either in 1 Timothy 2, verses 11 through 12. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Friend, we must study scripture in context and in light of its geographical and historical setting for accurate interpretation. If you're a lady out there, relax. You're going to enjoy this broadcast because we're going to get out the sharpest blade and slay some of the sacred cows that have held back anointed women of God for many years due to religious traditions. We're going to look at these apparent doctrinal contradictions spoken by Paul in the entirety of God's word instead of culture or popular opinion. Amen? Let's start out by asking who was the first preacher of the gospel. That would be a woman. The good news of Jesus' resurrection was proclaimed by none other than Mary Magdalene. In John 20 verse 18 it says, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Mary was indeed a faithful servant to the very end. She was at the crucifixion and also saw where Christ's body was laid to rest in Joseph's tomb and helped to prepare the spices and ointments for embalming his body. She and the other women present also returned to John and Simon Peter to let them know the stone that covered the tomb had been rolled away. Like I said, Mary Magdalene was the first person to see Jesus in his fully resurrected body and the first person sent to tell the others of the resurrected Christ. Friend, it looks like Jesus trusted women enough to be the first bearers of the good news of the gospel and appeared to them firstly. So why should we limit women preaching the gospel or teaching in any other capacity within the church today? Remember that when Jesus was dying on the cross, only Mary Magdalene, Mary mother of Jesus and the apostle John remained at Golgotha whilst the rest of the disciples fled into hiding. But after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to women firstly, which shows just how much he valued them, being in equal measure to the men. Mark chapter 15 verses 40 through 41 speaks of the women at the cross and it says there were also women looking on afar off among whom was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the less and of Joseph and Salome who also when he was in Galilee followed him and ministered unto him and many other women which came with him unto Jerusalem. It's also evident, friend, that in the early days of Jesus' ministry, he was followed by a large group of women, as documented in Luke 8.3. Let's read it now. And it came to pass afterward that when he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him, and certain women, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance." Based on this account, several women were partners of Jesus' ministry and assisted him provisionally and even financially. This tradition carried through into the book of Acts and the epistles as women served other disciples also. 
Now let's get down to the facts here. Throughout the book of Acts, there's a careful inclusion of women as well as men, both as believers and as objects of persecution, as all true followers of Christ will endure. No fewer than 11 women are specifically named in Acts, and five are involved in church-related ministries. Interestingly, after the ascension of Christ, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and her female associates are included in the decision-making process to select Judas's replacement in Acts 1.14, so we can clearly see just how important they were. The qualification for an apostle, of course, is that the person traveled with Jesus throughout his earthly ministry and must have been a witness of his resurrection. So clearly these ladies fit the qualification to be deemed an apostle, otherwise they wouldn't have been consulted for Judas' replacement. On a different level, one woman called Tabitha, also known as Dorcas, is specifically called a disciple, full of good works, in Acts chapter 9, because her ministry of social and spiritual outreach rendered her invaluable to the church. Also, if we review the writings of the Apostolic Fathers, greetings are sent by Ignatius to Tavia and her family, and Alsa is mentioned twice. These preservations in writing indicate a tradition in which respect might be accorded to the female leaders in the early church. So clearly, female leaders were embraced in the first three centuries of the church, according to history. The record of female ministers indeed continues throughout the New Testament, where Phoebe is mentioned as a servant in Romans 16 verses 1 through 2. If you look up the Greek word for servant, that very same word is translated deacon elsewhere in the King James. Some of the newer translations actually render Phoebe as a deaconess. Then later in Romans chapter 16, verses 3 through 4, Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned, whom Paul calls helpers. If you scour the New Testament as a whole, you'll find that Paul had seven female helpers in total during his ministry. What's interesting here is that Paul mentions the wife of Priscilla before the husband Aquila, with an implication that her ministry superseded that of her husband's in terms of importance or usefulness. Acts chapter 18 documents Priscilla's ministry. Aquila was likely a Jew from Pontus in Asia Minor, but Priscilla was originally a native of Rome. Priscilla was actually a name more frequently given to the patrician women or a member of one of the original citizen families of Rome, perhaps denoting non-Jewish birth, enjoying a higher social status. So clearly this lady had social standing in her time and perhaps great wealth also. So right now, friend, I'm showing you that Paul might have told the ladies to be quiet in the church at Corinth. But you can see also that he wasn't a woman hater because he valued their ministries and seven of them assisted him. Further still, Paul at the very end of his letter to the Roman church in Romans 16.12 salutes Tryphena, Trephosa, and Persis. From the Greek we know these individuals were women, and since Paul said of these ladies who labor in the Lord, then it's safe to conclude they had some kind of ministry and were recognized by Paul as being faithful in their service to the Lord. What what about the prophetic ministry, Pastor? Great question. Are women supposed to be prophesying like the men? Of course, friend, a resounding yes. Don't you recall the Apostle Peter quoting the book of Joel in Acts chapter 2 when he said, And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, in verse 18. And earlier in verse 17, your daughters shall prophesy. The Holy Scripture also states in Acts 1, 13 through 14 that several women were in the upper room when God poured out his precious Holy Spirit in addition to Mary, the mother of Jesus. So the ladies were certainly not excluded from this majestic outpouring of God's Holy Spirit for ministerial service. To the men out there, clearly God wants the ladies prophesying as much as the men, and we shouldn't stop them from doing so. When the Apostle Paul visited the house of Philip the Evangelist in Caesarea in Acts 21, 8 through 9, it says there were four women in that household who prophesied. Some speculate these four virgins were indeed Philip's daughters. Friend, it's important to realize in 1 Corinthians 11.3 that when Paul said that the man is the head of the woman, his context was marriage. In other words, not all men are head of women, only the husband of the wife in question. So guys, in church settings, we don't have authority over women or other people's wives, but only the husband of that wife has the authority over her. No man is the head over every woman. This is simply ridiculous. But religious people have jumped on this bandwagon and used it to wrongly boss women around. 
The man is only the head of the wife in the husband and wife relationship, not out of it. Because it does say in Ephesians 5.23 that certainly the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. But it's not sane to say every wife must obey her husband in everything because no husband can supersede any of the Lord's commandments. Friend, the truth is some folk want to lord it over the ladies, but there's no precedence in scripture for doing so. In the Genesis account of creation, there is no sign of inequality. Clearly male and female were created equal in the sight of God. This is further clarified by the Apostle Paul's statement in Galatians 3.28 when he said, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Friend, there is neither male nor female in Christ Jesus, for we are all one. Get this, friend. The truth is women are all called the sons of God in the New Testament as much as men are. Now let's get back to our source text in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 34 through 36. In the original Greek, remember, there's only one word for man, none for husband, and only one Greek word for woman, none for wife. We must then determine whether or not these controversial passages where Paul tells the women that they can't teach and to keep quiet in church, whether or not he's talking to the wives or women in general. But as with any interpretation, we need to look at the prior verse and the verse following. So let's read it again. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Did you notice that Paul switches in verse 35 to husbands? And this is the correct hermeneutic. He's talking to wives and husbands, friend. In the Corinthian church, scholars have revealed that men and women were seated separately across the aisles, as was the custom in other churches at the time. So what would happen is some eager wives were asking their husbands questions during the service. So Paul was saying they should wait until they're at home and then ask their husband instead of disrupting the service. So in this passage, Paul's not talking about women in general, but wives specifically and their untimely questions. Also, in 1 Timothy 2.12, Paul says he suffers not a woman to usurp authority over her husband, but she's better off seeking greater clarity later on at home about the sermon preached. Friend, in summary, let's get real here. The desire to oppress women and keep them down is satanic in origin, and some religions around the world heavily oppress women and friends. Frankly, it's disgusting what some ladies have to put up with in religious forums or churches. Suffice to say, are you telling me the ministries of Joyce Meyer and Marilyn Hickey, who's a bastion of truth in this city of Denver and performed wonderful works for the Lord overseas, and Pastor Lynette Hagen and other wonderful female ministers down the years who are doing great works for the Lord, are they working against God's will, friend? I don't think so. What about the female pioneers of the Pentecostal movement, like Amy Simple McPherson, Jenny Seymour, Ivy Campbell, and later Catherine Kuhlman, Francis Hunter, and many more who served God faithfully, but were never accepted by the wider Christian community? Friend, we do these women a great disservice to negate their enormous contribution. We should thank the Lord they never kept their mouth shut, as Paul instructed them to. You've been listening to Carl Joseph and the Lions Unchained podcast. Carl is a minister who has witnessed God's miraculous power to save, heal, and deliver. Carl covers topics such as geopolitics, current affairs, cults, societal trends, and end-time events, all through a biblical lens. Every Monday, new podcasts are uploaded, so stay tuned for the next opportunity to roar into victory. Check out carljosephministries.com for exciting articles, teachings, and discussion points. See you next week, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button.